All right, welcome uh, to this week's New Normal. I'm Brian Morrissey. Um, this week I'm joined by Jeff Carbajo. Jeff is a co-founder of High Snobiety. Before we get to that, um, before we get to you, Jeff, I want to just give my little plug for Digiday Plus. Um, this is our membership program. You should all become members. Jeff, I think you're a member. Um, you get unlimited stories. Um, we do exclusive events. We do premium research. Um, we do report reports and guides and all sorts of different things. Um, but anyway, um, please do um, become a member. Um, and since you're a, a loyal, uh, the new normal viewer, um, we have a discount for you. Um, if you use um, the code TNN at checkout, you're going to get 20% off. Um, that is TNN checkout. Just go to digiday.com slash subscribe. Um, so this week, we've been doing like a series. We had a little bit of a, I had a little bit of a break uh, between them, but kind of looking ahead about what is going to happen in a lot of industries. Because I think we talk a lot about accelerations in the media industry, and but these are happening across all sorts of different industries. Um, so I talked with Jill Madoff last week, a little bit, or two weeks ago about the fashion industry, but I want to continue the conversation um, with Jeff, particularly when it look, looking at the younger consumer and how the younger consumer is thinking about the entire notion of luxury because I think a lot of the trends that high society has been tracking for over a decade are now accelerating. Jeff, welcome. Oh, I, think oh, I was I was muted. My bad. Yeah, Sorry yeah. about that. Thanks That's a lot, okay. Brian. <laughs> Thanks for coming, Jeff. I was like, oh no, we are first like mechanical. Um, so you guys have been doing a lot of like research on this. First, is, for anyone who doesn't know high society, I mean, I had David Fisher uh, on on the podcast. Uh, like, I think it was a couple right. years ago. Back when we actually saw each other, I, I, I remember I went to Berlin and did it. Um, but, you know, high sobriety, I really thought about it as starting as like almost like a, sne a sneaker and streetwear blog that grew into something more um, because sneakers and streetwear has really infiltrated this, the fashion and luxury world. Right. So how do you end up describing the sort of purview that high sobriety has? Yeah, I think you nailed it. I think the the majority of people know High Snobiety as this sneaker streetwear uh, news platform or or trend platform. But what we what we really cover is is what we call lifestyle culture, and it's sort of a catch all word that embraces uh, a variety of different disciplines and and interests that do carry into fashion, do carry into uh, art and design and interiors, and. I think one of the easiest way to think about it is, you know, uh, the high snobiety reader is somebody that's looking for, you know, the very best. And in many ways, they're looking for things that may not necessarily be at their local mall. You know, what we're trying to do is um, bring up and uh, help emerge a lot of uh, new creatives. And many times those creatives use uh, a piece of clothing as a canvas. Uh, in, in some cases, they they use music and, you know, we bubble them up. And from the mainstream side, you know, there's a lot of crossover, as you mentioned now, a lot of what's, what was part of the, the underground, as they said, the high stability covered is now very much mainstream. You know, you have rappers who are referencing, of course, not only luxury, but, but sneakers. And um, we do our best to help main, the mainstream understand um, who the audience is that that we're speaking to, and when I say the mainstream, that's you know the brand partners that we have and services that we work with. Okay, so a lot of what you do in in this area revolves around I'm going to use the air quotes like the culture. Explain what yeah. that is exactly. It, it's tough. I think it 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 it, it, it comes off. <laughs> Culture can mean a variety of different things, but through the lens of high society, the, the culture is, is sometimes described as being cool. And I, I think what, what that really encompasses, and I think the, the New York Magazine had a great quote recently on this, and I, I apologize for uh, not knowing the writer, but it, it's really, uh, the, the culture is a, a, a collective of like-minded people that are, have like-minded interests. And they may not necessarily come from the same demographic. I always love to say, you know, I'm a Gen Xer, and I'm relating to the same things that millennials and kids that are in the Gen Z uh, are into. Um, so it's more of a mindset around uh, product, services, music, and more than ever, uh, social responsibility. Um, it, it just happens that 
there's a lot of great product that also wraps itself within it. And that product can come from almost anywhere. But the, you know, the main polls today, as you said, would be lifestyle, uh, streetwear, fashion, uh, the world of skate, and more than ever, art and music. So uh, the culture, culture is a, a bit of a catch-all, but really it is just like-minded individuals that are into to cool things. Okay, and so it's beyond streetwear, and it's Absolutely. not it's not just hype, right? So I think a lot of people, um, you know, think about like high sobriety and streetwear, and they think of hype. And and sure, to me, hype is like we we had our office on Mercer Street, um, and in those days, uh, you know, there was lines around the block at uh, Stadium Goods at the Nike sure. store. At V Files, remember the Justin Bieber? Justin Bieber sure. rap was lit. Although I will say this: the uh, <laughs> what's her name, the Kardashian, uh, the uh, the the uh, uh, who was it? Carly, Chloe? I don't remember which one. She had a lip kit that was Kylie. Uh, Kylie. I, I've never Kylie. I, I've never seen like the, the the New York Police Department must have deployed like um, like twenty five officers to do crowd control. Anyway, yeah, I think about those a lot about hype, but it's beyond hype. So, uh, if I can on hype, you know, hype does exist. It's it's not it's not isolated to the world of sneakers and streetwear. I mean, I think um, one hype moment that I've been paying a lot of attention to is uh, Uniqlo, the Japanese uh, basics brand. Uh, released uh, a pack of new masks uh, under the Airism line. And for those that are familiar, Airism is their uh, technical undergarments line that's uh, made to use in the summer. It's made of wicking material. You know, when that mask was released in Japan, there was insane hype around the Airism mask. And there's plenty of videos on the, uh, on, uh, on Instagram and on TikTok that you can find of these massive lines outside of the Uniqlo store. Now, that kind of messaging. Although that is very Japanese. As someone who's been to very Japan, Japanese, they love to line up for. It, it, it can be ramen. It can be a mask. It can be sure. anything. I think sometimes it, it's a courtesy. <laughs> where, where we where we sort of bunch the door and need you know the cops to come and and help kind of do line control. They're in line. Okay. But my my point in mentioning is that is that mask is actually being released next week here in the United States, and yeah. it's finally coming to the states and. You know, there is actually hype around this mask. People are quite excited about it. Um, but, you know, it, hype is definitely something that is a driver for consumers, uh, for brands today. And many brands believe that hype is the only way to reach consumers. We disagree to some extent on that. Hype is a moment. And really what we're trying to do at High Snobiety is not build moments, but really build, you know, more of, of, of movements to some extent where, um, you know, a brand doesn't just come out with a one hit wonder, a brand is really working to have a conversation with the consumer set that we reach um, in, in the long term. So hype is great, but hype does not move the needle long term. for right. brands. And, and I think the sort of the manifestation of, of hype was always the drop, right? And that's like a right. tactic. I think a lot of people maybe mistake it or and like, you know, think about it as more than a tactic. But it's you know it seems like it's artificial scarcity of a product in order to for really mostly for marketing purposes it would seem I mean that's why these lines exist right yeah so the the drop model is an interesting one and it, it's funny enough it also um, really uh, came into its own through the Japanese market um, it's it's a it was originally a mechanism it was originally a mechanism to bring a consumer back into a store throughout a season so. If you if you imagine traditional retail pre-COVID, you know, uh, spring summer collection would hit stores uh, very close to the end of winter. You'd have your consumer, your clientele that would come in. They'd buy their purchases, and maybe they'd filter back. And certainly, you'd have you know uh, new traffic coming through your store. But the drop was really a mechanism to have clientele return again and make new purchases. In the context of what the drop is today, especially in the U.S. market. I think it works in two ways. Uh, the first, it works as a gateway uh, to get a consumer into the store. If we're looking at luxury, I think one of the most uh, prominent examples would be the Balenciaga Triple S uh, sneaker. It's a sneaker that came out a few years ago. You know, no average, not many sneakerheads, I'd argue, would walk into a Balenciaga for a sneaker. 
but they really well play that product where they built drops around it to get people in the store. And, you know, the hopes for Balenciaga, of course, so that those consumers enter the store and decide to purchase more or sort of come into their own with it. Um, but the drop today, I think where it, where a lot of brands um, are using it in maybe not the best manner is sort of, you know, put it out there and that's it. You know, we don't want, the consumer today doesn't want to just walk into a store and get one piece and move on. They, there has to be some sort of energy that has them coming back day to day. And again, if the drop is not, you know, followed up with some, some energy, I, I also don't believe it's that effective. So I, th I think of streetwear and like there are a lot of brands like sort of sprung up out of this, um, out, of, out of this culture, if you will, um, you know, think about Supreme and even before that Stussy um, and Baby Nape and, and all these sort of skate, sometimes surf brands and stuff. And then there was the, the, the traditional luxury houses, right? And they, they operated very separately. And then they sort of, I don't know, there was this mixture. I think one of the interesting things that, you know, we have glossy like in the fashion is like, there's some parallels to, to publishing is it, it, you know, you had these traditional legacy players and then you had these upstarts and then everyone starts to mix together. Um, so obviously Balenciaga, everyone makes sneakers, everyone does drops, everyone does hoodies, everyone does tees. Um, explain what was happening pre-COVID with how the luxury industry was themselves um, adapting and sort of stealing some of the tricks from the upstarts. Yeah, so if I can, I'd love to step back to your Stussy example because Stussy truly did start as a, as, as a surf brand. And when we look at brands that were part of what we call those core action sports, skate, street, and snow, the majority of those brands stay within their lane. What Stussy did very early on in the 80s was it began to take the very best hints of what was happening in luxury and essentially reappropriating it onto their onto their product. So, you know, Stussy is well known for uh, reappropriating um, some Comme des Garcons uh, logo imagery. Uh, and certainly Supreme is, is pretty well known for having um, essentially used the Louis Vuitton monograph on their uh, skateboards, which they were, you know, sued for and sent cease and desist. What's interesting about that is, you know, Skate in many ways was trying to, you know, uh, supreme in that sense. And again, I, I'm not James Jebbia, but my I, my thought here is that he was paying homage to it, right? The idea of flipping logos is something that's very core to uh, streetwear and to street fashion. You you can see it everywhere. Brands. I don't know if folks are uh, old enough to remember when the Tide logo was flipped. It showed up in plenty of movies, but it was done by a brand called Fresh Dive. So when, when Supreme was sued by Louis Vuitton, you know, that was sort of that moment where we're like, you know, there was no crossing the line. What's yeah. interesting about High Somebody is that guard, we, The old guard was fighting the new guard. I mean, totally. now totally. They well, did. Supreme's like a billion dollar brand. Um, right. So move it forward. And what you have is Supreme in the last two years working with Louis Vuitton in a moment that us here at High Stability really feel like, you know, it was the most validating moment for what we were doing um, because it showed that, you know, for the first time, these two were coming together. But in terms of the question that you asked around, you know, what are they doing today? How are they reaching that young consumer? It, it can't be understated the communication factor. You know, young consumers today use tools that luxury brands may not have used in the last decade. You know, Burberry has certainly been ahead of the curve in, in embracing the, the digital world. You know, at one point they had a war room with over 100 designers building assets. But when you look at Louis Vuitton, which I believe is the slide that's on the screen now, you know, Virgil Abloh, who is the creative director of men's for Louis Vuitton, you know, what he's bringing to the table is not only his POV on, you know, what Vuitton can be for the future for a new consumer, but he's also a master communicator. And in, a, in, in, in many senses, what these luxury houses need and certainly luxury groups need are individuals within their, their organizations that know how to speak to the younger generation on their terms. And, you know, really, I think Virgil's work at LV is, is a strong example of that. Yeah. And also he's like a, a capital C creative, right? I mean, he's not like a trained, he didn't go to Parsons. 
he, I think he went to architecture school, right? And he, he went to architecture school. I'm in Miami and he just opened his flagship in the design. Division. He did. He did. Um, so I explain what the, the shifts that were already happening pre-corona in, in, in luxury and, um, particularly when it comes to like authenticity and per, I, in, in a report you guys did, you, you talked about, I like the perceived authenticity because anytime brands enter into any culture or subculture, you know, they're going to try, they're going to end up coming across as inauthentic because ultimately they're, they're there to sell pro some product. Right. Um, and I, I just think most times it doesn't come across as, as authentic as much as they want to create culture. Usually they're drafting off culture. Um, but it explained exactly what was going on with um, luxury because I mean we had, you know, I think it seems like the big shift was was one we're seeing across many industries, which is going from top down to bottom up. Right. It, it, so I, I think we have a, maybe a slide on this, but by 2025, the luxury consumer, um, I, I think I have this correct, millennials and Gen Z will make up 60% of the luxury um, spending that's done. There it is right there. Millennials and Gen Z will make up 60% of that luxury market by 2026, apologies. Um, now, within that number, we believe they're going to add about half a trillion dollars in spending in luxury as well. So, you know, two or two years ago, when we began to ask questions around what is luxury today to that young consumer, um, which really came uh, through a survey that we had done uh, early on and is now sort of manifested into work that we've done with BCG, what we found was that there were new, you know, sort of harp strings that were being pulled um, with the younger generation that may not necessarily uh, be pulled with ours. So I don't know, Brian, maybe you and I, when we think of a brand, we think of the heritage and the legacy that they, you know, and how long they've been around. You know, time has always played into um, the the story of luxury brands. You know, Hermes uh, been around for over a well, hundred years. European luxury is like, you know, it's been going back centuries and Chanel and all. Absolutely, stuff. yeah. And you but know, I mean, that was sort of always, it was always weird in an American contest context, I feel like, because luxury is about exclusivity. It's the opposite of the chaotic, small d democratic, um, you know, society that we, that we've built here for better or for worse. And we don't have that respect for authority and we don't have a long history. Well, luxury certainly has a, a, a lot. Many would argue that the United States has to figure out and really step themselves into luxury. Certainly Ralph Lauren is there. To some extent, Calvin Klein, but they've been difficult. They've, they've had quite some some difficult times in, in, in sort of finding where they want to go. But luxury today to that young consumer is not so much about exclusivity as it is about accessibility. Now, accessibility does not necessarily uh, mean that every consumer will have the means to be able to purchase a product, but the doors are open for them. And, you know, pre-COVID, when you walked down Madison Avenue, we'll step back. You know, a decade ago, when you walked down Madison Avenue, every luxury door was closed. You know, there's a there's a security guard there who looked you over and then opened the door and let you in, right? And I think what we're seeing with a new luxury is that accessibility is everything, and every door is now open. You know, and they want those consumers to come in there. One other conversation that really comes out of the new luxury is, you know, does it benefit a brand to allow for uh, uh, an average pedestrian or consumer coming into the store to be photographed in a product that they may not purchase. They may not purchase. And, you know, one side of it is, yeah, I mean, it's, it's free marketing. They're, they're, they're putting themselves out there. They're building energy. Mm -hmm. On the other side, is it converting to uh, a new customer? Maybe not for that 16 or 17 year old, but the hope is that down the line they will. So, you know, I, I think accessibility is a big one and sort of this equal playing field that, while I may not be able to, you know, purchase this product, I still want to be able to get my hands on it and, and have an experience with it. So uh, explain to me like a little bit about why, like of the old guard, it seems like Gucci has done the best job with adapting. Yeah, for sure. They've been, they were I mean, early. You can't argue with the results, right? I, I went to yeah. the Ball, Ball Harbor shops to see what a mall is like now. And, uh, the Gucci store was attracting a lot of uh, a lot of clientele, and now they're doing temperature checks. That's the new exclusivity. It is, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but explain what they have done well and how that fits into this bottom up. Because I mean, obviously they've got a creative genius and 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 a 
Alessandro Michele, but like, what, what is, why has Gucci done so well? And isn't that accessibility of having, not most people can't afford most Gucci stuff, but you might be able to spring sure. some slides or, the, or maybe the sneakers if you save up a little bit. Well, the old, the, the, old, the, old, the old technique with Gucci is that you'd walk in there and walk out with a bell because it was the, the, it was the most economically priced, most visible piece you could wear. You know, you tuck your shirt in and your belt would let people know you had a Gucci belt on. And, and you're absolutely right. Like wearing a pair of Gucci loafers or even slides today is as the kids call it a flex. You know, people love to see that. But I think what Alessandro did, and you know, it can't be understated, one of the, one of the fantastic, uh, one of the things that I find quite fantastic about Alessandro and, and Kim Jones at Dior and, you know, and Virgil, uh, these guys all in many ways came out of some level of street culture. They were either skaters themselves, they were either into the music that encompasses, you know, uh, the culture, as they say, you know, hip hop, punk rock. So they all have roots in it. In fact, Kim Jones at Dior himself was an internet uh, a distributor called Gimme Five that was one of the biggest streetwear distributors in, in the UK at the time. So their roots are very much in the world that we play in. So it's not surprising to see as they come up and now become, you know, C-level creatives themselves, their influence of what came from their past is really breaking through. Gucci, you're absolutely right, came first. You know, we've did some, full disclosure, we did a lot of work with them around a collection called Gucci Ghost, which was done with a gentleman named uh, Trevor Andrews, who himself is a snowboarder uh, and is in a band. And, you know, bringing skate and connecting skate to Gucci, it's, again, it's always been there in a very subtle flex. I think when we were able to work with them and bring some real skateboarders uh, into the fold and, and do some shoots, it, it connected very well. And the last story I want to share about Gucci when that Gucci Ghost collection launched a few years ago, we worked with them on uh, an event in our Berlin store. And it's interesting because you had the, the traditional Gucci consumer, which was a, a, an older white woman coming in with a champagne flute, walking into a store with a, sca a stack of skateboards that were thrown in the corner and mixing in with that crowd, you know? But the truth is, you're absolutely right. It was effective. And in fact, in the last two years, I believe Gucci has been able to decrease their, their average age by over a decade. So the, the traditional Gucci consumer is getting younger and they're certainly the example of, of doing it right. Okay, so what has, I mean, coronavirus has upended like every industry uh, and um, you guys did, um, you know, this report about the culture, you know, I think it finished right before Corona right. Um, uh, hit us, but, what is going to be, I mean, it's hard to look ahead, but how does this, this world change at the, on the other side of this? I mean, obviously we're in for a, a long economic downturn. Those are just the economic parts, but also this is like a time of a lot of soul searching and, you know, look, there's some people who think that we'll just spring back to, to normal. And, and there's others that think this is, you know, a time of, of great change. Yeah, so we, we actually did two studies. We did a, a study, excuse me, in the middle of COVID that we call the Immunized Shopper. And, and then of course, Culture, 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 which is a, a larger uh, work that we did with uh, BCG that we've actually worked with over the last year. Immunized Shopper was, um, and this is available on High and I should be, I'll, I'll, I'll figure out how to link people if they're looking for it. I think if you look up Immunized Shopper, it's there. But we wanted to get, essentially a quick take on how our consumer was, was thinking about things. And one thing that we're very lucky to have at High Sobiety is a quite broad um, group of individuals that allow us to survey them. And they're not, you know, they're, they're looking to give back and really be part of the conversation, you know, so they're not being, you know, we're not teasing them with free iPads to do this kind of stuff. You know, they're, they're getting involved because right. they want to get involved. And uh, some of the more interesting things that came about it you know, number one, the the positivity around what's coming next remained very high, and that was something that was that was quite interesting. You know, people certainly knew that you know we're we're in for a tough time, but the positivity among those young uh, consumers is still there. But in terms of how they spend their money, um, it, it definitely changed. You know, we're seeing cer certainly a shift away from um, maybe non essentials to more. Um, uh, home goods in that sense. 
And, you know, one thing that we did find is that they're allergic to hype. And in that sense, what, what they're saying is, you know, the, the large, broad uh, flash moments in, 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 in the culture, you know, through releases that may have big logos and, you know, being able to buy a second pair of non-essential shoes is not going to be part of the future, at least in the foreseeable the foreseeable time. Ex you know? Explain that a little bit more. Why, why, why that sounds like a very interesting and profound change. It, 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 I think, you know, part of it is people don't have anywhere to go to some extent. Like, who are you dressing up for? You know what I mean? So for as much as- I'm not wearing shoes at all right now. I got to be honest with you. <laughs> well, what I'm getting at is, you know, we all want to look good when we step out to some extent, right? And part of part of the culture is the fact that we all want to dress up. And, you know, there's a lot of people that have spent the last six months um, going nowhere. So why do I need to put on a, a pair of uh, Gucci slides or Gucci loafers to go out the door? So I think th that's sort of the first one. Second, I think, is that, you know, the fact that home decor and, and furniture um, itself is seeing an uptick. So again, the fact that we're staying at home and for as much as we want to dress good for the, the for the world outside, I think people are being looking much more internally now into their surroundings, you know. And and what's, I'm what's cool is you that got, you've got a good plant game going. I mean, plants. Yeah, this is this, yeah. This is my wife's game. She just got that, and the TV was for my son who originally got <laughs> who was just uh, who, who 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 was who was ill and needed a, a TV. But I think taking care of the house is it. And what's also very interesting, and I don't think this is in uh, the Union Shopper, is that these home goods themselves are also being coveted in the same way that sneakers and clothing are being coveted. You know, the average carpet now is something that can be seen as a desirable object. A coffee table can be seen as a desirable object. And, you know, it, it's not so much that it's shifting from sneakers to homeware, as much as people are like, you know, how, how can the two not be part of the same conversation in many ways. And yeah, no, I think if you go to high school. Like plants are, plants are very big. I mean, it, a lot of people are flexing with the plants. Absolutely. You know, and plants unfortunately have a lifespan to some extent. So there's a, a, a bit more that's required there. But, you know, there's a lot of plant upstarts that are popping off where, you know, people are learning to garden. And honestly, like plants, probably one of the best things to get into because it's just amazing. And I don't know. I find them meditative to some extent. But uh, you know, we're not going out, right? And I think in one of I think we have a we have a slide in here about someone like you know having a soul searching moment, and I don't know if it'll last. About uh, I believe it's a him his sneaker collection, um, and you know what does that post hype era look like when it was built off of you know a, a form of fairly conspicuous consumerism? Um, sure. Does that does that get modulated, or do you think, hey, you know what, the animal spirits of capitalism will reassert themselves? It, I, I just had this conversation with somebody recently around. I think the term is revenge shopping. It's the idea that you, you know, once the doors open, people want to get out there and spend their money. And I, I do believe that you know that consumers want to get back out there and they they want to they want new things at times. You know, we've been to your point stuck in our houses. Um, I, I do believe that the consumption levels will, will certainly not be the same, but I do believe that we'll, we'll, we're going to recover from this and people are going to continue to buy cool sneakers and, and, certainly, um, and certainly cool objects as well. Yeah, that's one of the questions we got ahead of time. Um, I, it was a comment of sorts, like I'm quite skeptical about a more sustainable consumer. We have seen revenge buying in China and the high rows, I think that lines at, uh, in Zara. Um, that is definitely, I definitely saw a giant line outside of Zara in New York. Is this, I think a lot of people project when they come to the trends of coming out of um, COVID. And one of them is, is this idea of a more sustainable system and everything's gonna be you know, nicer and better for the planet and stuff like this. Is that really going to happen, or are people going to have less money, so they're going to be care less about um, you know all of the sustainability stuff that's that's frankly, in my view, used a lot of times for marketing? Yeah, sustainability is an interesting one because you know I, it, it, I think at a very general level, sustainability is this idea that we can have a full circle three hundred and sixty 
sort of clean system in order to, to produce product where there's no waste. I think we have a quite a long time to get there. I think what's a more interesting idea is responsibility. And there's brands out there that are taking responsible approaches. You know, they may not be able to um, use the most organic cotton or the most sustainable cotton. So they think of other ways around it. Maybe they can save on the packaging side. So I think there's ways to get closer to it. And actually, I think what falls within the sustainability conversation as well, and maybe from the outskirts a little bit, is this idea of upcycling. You know, if we look at the reseller market or even the vintage market, and by the way, I put eBay in that, I put every corner store, vintage store, I put uh, stock X, I put stadium goods. These are all you know sneaker consignment and marketplaces. It's, it, I think for the first time, we all believe that there's just way too much product in the market. Patagonia is really, you know, they've, they've owned this conversation. You know, they literally have a campaign telling people not to buy new things. Don't buy our product, you know, go find an old Patagonia piece and let us fix it and, and continue on. So I think there's something to that. So, um, and, and it's funny, I, I have some data around um, sneaker sales that show that while the volume of sneaker sneakers on the resale platforms have has gone down a bit uh, th- even though the volume has gone down you know the prices that some of these products are holding is still there but i think that's another conversation i think yeah. right now when we think about sustainability there's a I, I would prefer to think about responsibility and how we ensure that what's in the system today doesn't just get doesn't sit in your shelf for the next two years before you throw it out yeah i mean i just feel like at best it becomes like a sort of table stakes thing i think you and i used to sometimes take the the ferry together in new york, back in new york sure. and, went to offices. and uh you know veja was the official sneaker of the ferry and that's right I remember an interview with the founder who was like you know the sustainability stuff Honestly, without the style, like people would not be buying these sneakers. It's true. Um, Things need to look good. Yeah, one of the um, one of the the questions we got ahead of time that I think is I I I have my idea for an answer, but I want to hear is because you know more about it. Is what's the next subculture to drive a luxury brand movement? You know, after skateboarding, surfing, hip hop, others. It's a great question. In fact, we've been talking a lot about that. Um, you know, I think it's for those for those who are not paying attention. I think esports and live game streaming, which really are two things, are quite interesting. Um, you know, I, I've actually spent quite some time talking to uh, to peers in the industry about this and taking as many calls as I can because. It is a conversation that's coming up more and more, and it feels like quite some white space today. Louis Vuitton uh, famously produced the League of Legends um, trophy box. Uh, Louis Vuitton, of course, has also made other trophy box, I believe, for the World Cup, if not for the Euro Cup in, uh, in, in the European side. But it, it, I, I don't know where it's going to land because I think you know within within those two subcultures, and again, I think those are the the ones that are really the ones that have potential, the consumer set that's, the consumer set really looks at it as they're following either a live gamer, somebody that's on like a platform like Twitch, or they're following the team stuff, right? And the the team stuff, the team stuff is an opportunity that's not that dissimilar than what we see, say, in the NBA or an MLB around sort of the franchising of, 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 of brands or, or sponsorships in that sense. So I think there's two playing fields there. And quite honestly, that's the only one that's been top of mind for me for some time. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, the thing with High Snow Body is that we're constantly looking for what's next. Yeah. Uh, what about um, luxury moving into, like, digital clothing? This is what I'm very skeptical of. And, and this is, an, again, another conversation, too. There's, you know, there's an article in Forbes about a, a platform called Aglet. Um, just the other day, and Aglet is a, 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 a digital game that allows for people to actually track their steps to buy and, excuse me, to win digital assets. And most of them happen to be these digital sneakers. And the conversation I have with the Aglet guys is, you know, you know, are any of these sort of official through the Nikes, the Adidas, and more importantly, like, you know, where's the provenance? Where's the authentication on these things? I, I do think there's a big opportunity for it. You know, Lil Michaela, who's a digital influencer. Um, 
it's hard for me to kind of think of her of anything else than a digital influencer. You know, to a young doesn't consumer, she doesn't exist as in in human form. Well, she's like, based on a human for sure, um, but she doesn't exist in human form. She just signed a deal with CAA, by the way. So we're going to be seeing more of Michaela. Who but to that it? younger, that's your research to do, Brian. But the, you know, a Michaela, and, and she's not the only one out there. You know, digital influencers have been with, you know, have been in Korea and certainly in Japan for quite some time. I think even some guy married a digital influencer at one point, but. The young consumer today doesn't necessarily see real as the way that I or you see real in that sense, you know, to them, it's like, you know, so what if she's not a real character, she's actually wearing real clothes. And I think there's also an opportunity there. The question is, how do you, how do you put the digital controls on it? Because at the end of the day, we know that scarcity is quite an important conversation. So that's a question we got, which is, you know, asking your thoughts on the best ways to use social, you can interpret that broadly, to promote luxury goods without, um, you know, without sacrificing um, both that exclusivity, but also without coming across tone deaf. I mean, there, there's a lot of death that's happened. And there's a lot of- Plenty of examples. Go yeah, on. I've, I've had this conversation with creative directors and the majority of creative directors at luxury houses, the majority of them, you know, they themselves are not ready to just start outputting massive amounts of product into the market as well. You know, that does feel very tone deaf. So they've all taken various steps in sort of uh, presenting their collections. One that comes to mind is a brand called Lueve that many people would see as low. It's W. It's a L O E W E. Um, what they did this season, which I thought was great, is that they delivered essentially a box that was something that was quite physical and that it allowed you to feel every material that was on the runway. So it was like a, a swatch box of sense, uh, in a sense, where you could feel the fabrics. And it was something that was used while you watched this digital runway show. And uh, again, you know, it, it, you, you got to be sensitive to the fact that you know the, the market's in a the market the market may be doing great, but the world may not be doing as well as the market shows. And and certainly to your point earlier, the next few months, especially when October comes, speaking you know, looking at New York, what happens when all of these outdoor cafes or outdoor eating areas have to shut down? You know, what's going to happen then? All the luxury houses are thinking about this and certainly doing their best to um, uh, pl play a safer card for sure. That was another question we got, which is, um, you know, if a second wave of COVID hits, um, I think I'm in a second wave here in Miami, but like if it does hit New York, let's say, uh, do you think consumers are going to then be more frugal and less inclined to shop? Um, and, and at which point that would, I assume, negatively impact uh, the fashion industry? Uh, I'll answer that in the reverse. What we're hearing more and more from um, the brands and certainly the larger brands is they're all figuring out how to how to get more direct with that consumer D 2 C of course you know yeah. uh, very big brands have done a you know they've done a good job of marketing to the masses and you know driving people into their uh, wholesale partners and big box stores but more than ever they're now seeing that that consumer you know that consumer is coming direct to them we've talked to sneaker brands that have told us that they've had their largest E you know, online sales days during COVID and not even for hype product, but for basic things such as running shoes, which, you know, of course, is a massive uh, fitness trend happening. We know in the United States, there's a shortage of, of fitness equipment. I myself had to buy some weights off yeah. of a Facebook marketplace reseller recently. So, you know, it's, right I, I think, it's, modern retail. it's hard to get kettlebells. Supply chain to get kettlebells. I, guy, I literally, I literally met a guy who had a truck full of kettlebell, uh, dumbbells and I was one of five people waiting to buy dumbbells from it was insane so listen capitalism everywhere as they say but you know talking directly to consumer is, is something that a lot of marketing teams and a lot of comms teams are thinking about today and that's a that's a bit of a shift of how they did things in the past so my take is that brands are going to get better at communicating directly the longer that these stores remain uh closed or, or if they're reclosed Okay. Um, one of the, uh, this is actually kind of related, but I think it would be good to delve into more because 
Um, you know, I think pre-corona, obviously one of the big, um, you know, changes within particularly the Western economies was the, you know, the yawning gap between the haves and have-nots. Um, and the question it was, uh, should luxury brands try to be less quote unquote obvious while subtly staying top of mind for the foreseeable future in order to avoid public backlash as we look more closely at the haves versus the have nots. I mean, we're in a very strange time where like, you know, a, most normal folks are worried about having a job and the stock market is at sure. a record uh, high um, and Apple's worth 2 trillion and it's all sorts of stuff that's going on. Um, so how, how do you see luxury brands? Are they, are they just going quiet? Yeah, you know, if we're looking at traditional luxury houses that have been here for decades, you know, in generations, they've, you know, they, they've built, you know, they're built in a, in a, they're in a place where they're, they're set to go for a while. They can, I think they can hold out. Most of these houses can, um, you know, places like, you know, Hermes is not going anywhere. You know, Balenciaga is not going anywhere. They've they've been here for some time, and uh, I I don't have the answer as to what they're what they're going to do, but they can uh, they can sustain they can relax and 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 wait for sort of the the world to reset. And it's it's really not that dissimilar to what's happened um, you know during the recession and and certainly at other points in in uh, the world's history. These guys got a lot of money, you know, and they've been they've been sitting on a lot of money for some time and they're going to make it through it. I think what's important is what happens on the other side of that. Now, the if we look at the traditional luxury consumer, they tend to be a bit older. Um, you know, there's a new consumer coming in. And again, as I mentioned earlier, how they begin to communicate to that younger consumer is going to be very important in, in, in their success in the future. But for now, you know, these guys can, these guys can hold out. Do you see any BTC brands becoming luxury brands, like true luxury brands? It's, it, it, I love this conversation because it really gets back to the new luxury. You know, there's a consumer out there that would say, would say an off-white is a luxury brand. We have a, a certain amount of consumers that would even say that a brand like uh, Affair of God is a luxury brand based on their price point. Um, but what they don't have in the traditional definition of luxury is time behind them, legacy. So I, I do believe that the consumer today may not, um, they might not equate how long a brand has been around with them actually being luxurious, the same way that I certainly was, was brought up to believe. So I, I, I think that we can have, the, the new definition of luxury certainly allows for upstart brands to enter that field and remain there. And something else to kind of think about too, the idea that a brand needs to, to remain with us forever is also not maybe as sound as it used to be. You know, uh, why does a brand have to exist for 20 years? You know, in many ways, we're starting to see small brands pop up, deliver, um, you know, high quality product. And in some, time, in some cases at the, at, yeah. the, at the top of what they're at, they, they shut down and they sort of reinvent themselves. So yeah, there's there's a lot of that. Happening. I mean, everyone was talking about that monster for a little. That monster. Which one? Sorry. That monster. Yeah, for sure. Um, That's a great example. I was talking about them for like a few years, and then I don't even know if they're the guy sort of went off to do. He joined like a, a, a like an established label label. But um, so uh, okay, so DTC, you do see some of these um, emerging. One question I have that's related to this um, this time because it's a personal thing. It's like. Because there, there have been a lot of like pirated um, masks. So I don't understand why the mask, which is going to be with us until a, a vaccine is broadly available, does not become like a sneaker. And, and I, I understand that a lot of traditional luxury brands don't want to get involved in, in that world. I know Off-White got, um, got pilloried, right, for having like a high-priced mask. And I'm like, why not? Why not? It's, it's, it's on your face. You should be wearing it all the time in public. Why should this not be the new sneaker or even the new yeah. handbag? I agree with you. You've nailed it. The, the mask has become the new accessory. You know, it, if you look at a, if you look in the men's space, the watch was the first thing. You know, yeah. if you you could you could 
you know, you could wear whatever you wanted. And as long as you had a nice watch on, people saw that and they understood it. And of course now sneakers and other product in, in the women's space, uh, certainly handbags and shoes. And I think you're absolutely right. The mask has become something that's coveted. I, I, in, you know, the luxury houses were actually some of the first to, you know, turn their factories over into helping to um, produce a lot of the, uh, the, the protective gear that's necessary to treat patients. So they actually very much were on the front lines and have certainly donated. And to your point, I think that, you know, if not somebody to wants- their, Not to put their logo on it and to be like, this is, you know, crafted and, and all this sort of thing. Yeah. It's an expression of who you are. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a, uh, I'm a, I'm a, uh, I have to admit, I'm one of those guys. I have a mask that's not here with me that is a mask by a brand called Pure Blue Japan, which is a, Jap a very small independent Japanese denim maker. It's a mask that was given away to clientele who bought jeans in Japan. And I literally went out of my way to get my hands on one of these masks in, because I love this product. And it's not a mask that was available on retail and it's not a mask that you can buy. But yeah, it's a little bit of a flex for me to have this mask. But mm -hmm. I think that speaks to my desire to, you know, if I'm going to buy a great pair of jeans, I also want to wear a great mask. And you're absolutely right. The mask, you know, and certainly within the North Amer within North America and the Western world is always kind of, you know, let's be honest. I mean, there's a lot of people in this world that when they saw, you know, the traditional Asian markets wearing these masks are like, why the hell are they wearing masks? They're having that aha moment today. You know, those yeah. guys were clearly onto something and you're absolutely right. It's, it, it's, it's not just a, an, an ephemeral thing. You know, people want to look good. They want to look good and they're going to spend money on masks. It is just to go back to the ferry for a minute there, because I missed the ferry so much is <laughs> it was not long ago. It was like in February, I believe that there was a sign you're getting on the ferry that like people wear masks for different reasons. And so you shouldn't like harass someone for like wearing a mask. It's like really like the world never saw that. Has, the world has changed. The world's um, changed. The world's changed. You know, it's funny. Uh, they're 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 kind of laughing at the West a little bit in that sense, yeah. you know, but go ahead. Sorry. I, I never. Yeah. Um, so one of the other questions that we got, I want to encourage people to use the Q&A if, um, if you have questions that you want to throw in there is where will cool. This is also in quotes come from. Now that the ways of broadcasting cool, such as wearing um, the latest and greatest out in public and posting online are gone. I guess posting online is, is still around. Yeah, it's it, it's great. And again, you know, how we define cool, you know, is subjective to some sense. You know, I, I, it, to, to be cool means to be comfortable with yourself. It means to be, you know, uh, to be an individual and to know that you, you know, what you like. Uh, part of that more than ever is you sharing your likes with other people. We do that through platforms like uh, Instagram, of course. I, I, I do it all the time. You know, if I if I get a new sneaker that I'm in love with, I I post it up. You know, because I love it. But uh, being cool really starts. Uh, I'm not trying to say this to be cheesy or cliche, but it really starts within yourself. You know, you need to have a strong sense of what you're into. And I think that uh, there's a lot of social media and properties like Heist and Body that can help you find. Um, things that we believe to be cool, but it, it's not necessarily about being limited. It's not necessarily about perceived uh, scarcity. It's really about being comfortable with yourself and uh, surrounding yourself with, with, with product that you believe in. This is exactly the message that Damone had in Fast Times at Bridgemont High. No shit. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're dating us. He lectured Mark the Rat Ratner on this. Uh, everyone should watch Fast Times Bridgemont High. We should require you should require all the young people at your office to watch Fast Times. Bridgemont Amazing High. films. Yeah. It's, it always has been, I might add. Um, okay, Jeff, we're gonna leave it there on the Fast Times of Bridgemont High. Um, but thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Appreciate the time and stay and safe down all. there. Yeah, exactly. I'll stay safe from the sunburn. Uh, thank you all for uh, joining us. We will be back um, next week. We have a, a new episode of The New Normal, um, and uh, I'm going to be talking to Kale Weissman about uh, where retail goes. He is the editor of uh, our brand, Modern Retail, so please join us next Thursday at noon. Thanks again, Jeff. Thank you all for joining. Thank you, Brian. Take care, guys.